I've known so many people in my lifetime who, from my own personal observation of them, uh, just uh, couldn't be happy. They were incapable of it. And something I've found out over time, including in my own life, is that the only way you're ever going to be happy uh, is if you let yourself be happy. There's no secret, right? There's no big aha moment in your life where you go, oh, that one thing will make me happy. That's not how it works. Because I've seen people with who had everything and could get anything that they wanted and they're not happy at all. And on the other side of the coin, I've seen people who had nothing, seemingly nothing, and were just as happy as pigs in a mud puddle. Uh, so, like, what does that tell us? I'll tell you one thing for sure. <laughs> uh, It actually tells us everything we need to know. It's just that we don't want to believe it because the choice of being unhappy is makes you feel in control. <laughs> and I think some people would rather be in control than actually be happy. a strange and kind of beautiful commerce that happens between people uh, and I imagine it happens in all walks of life it isn't just musicians that this happens to it's uh, it's probably anybody and uh, but especially musicians I think because we deal in emotions we sell emotions we package feelings and memories and if you're good enough at making them uh, universal and relatable to everybody well then you become very successful to the point where a after you've done that for a while you can actually put forth new ideas new emotions and feelings and things that happen to you personally that your audience accepts because they loved everything you did up to that point. They're like, yeah, he was talking about me on that song, and this, he, you know, that's my life he's writing. And then you write something that's more personal, and they go, oh, wow, he's divulging something to us about himself, you know? And then, of course, there's always one person or, or more that actually has the same life experiences as you, you know? You're never alone in this world, right? It doesn't matter what happens to you. You're never alone. And throughout my career, there's the... the Well, here's the thing. Uh, again, you know, Hilda had a rough life. She, she wouldn't want anybody to... She wouldn't talk about it. She talked about it to me and her friends and stuff and things like that. But she had a terrible life. A rough. It was a rough place for someone like that to grow to grow up in and and be thrown into the industry at the age of fifteen years old, uh, you know. And she was a very small woman, ninety nine pounds, four foot eleven, 
and she had that complex, you know, she didn't want to be treated like she was a person that you, if you picked her up, she'd kill you. You couldn't pick her up off the floor. She'd kill you. She hated that. She did. She, she didn't like anything that demonstrated the, the, the frailty of her size. She was like a little dog, you know, have small dogs have a big dog syndrome. They think they're bigger than they are. And so she, all, I think a lot of people who are of small stature get picked on, you know, when they're little and when they're growing up and, and it, it leaves an indelible mark on people and it causes people to do, you know, and act and, and, and interact with the world in ways that aren't healthy. You know, I was, I was, I actually lived in both worlds because when I was a child, I was really tiny and frail and, and weak and it wasn't until I hit puberty, hit 16 years old, that I grew seven inches and put on a hundred pounds. And before that, holy God, I was, I was picked on, brutally picked on by kids and, and adult adults. And it was just, uh, you know, I have a lot of sympathy for Hilda. I have no, I have, I, I, and I just do because, but I, at the time we were married, it was very difficult to separate myself from, her and her, the way she did things, you know, so I couldn't, I couldn't really fight it, because I couldn't go against her, it was too dangerous to go against her, she, she would, she would just stay angry about something, and remember everything that happened in minute detail, and it was never, uh, you know, what really happened, it was, it was, it was what happened through her filter, and so, it was very difficult to live that way, and she she was a type of person, and again, she was, was definitely not alone in this, I've known lots of people like this, she couldn't be happy, she, nothing was ever right, she, if some, it, it didn't matter what happened, she would only see the negative, or create a negative when there wasn't even one there, she would create it, and you know, and say, well, we this, this, and this. So, to give you an example, you know, uh, the, this house became a, a living nightmare. And the, the, it, it wasn't all her fault, obviously. And I'm about to get into that. But things like, we, had, by the time we had the house livable, you know, about four or five years in, we had spent close to $400,000 on this, on this house. And it was sitting on 23 acres of oceanfront property in one of the most beautiful places you ever saw. The ocean was right at my front door and the mountains were behind us. We were completely secluded. There wasn't another neighbor anywhere, hardly. Well, you could see a guy down below at the road, but he was, there was never anybody in the house. And this place was gorgeous. It was unbelievably beautiful, this place. And we had money and we had cars. We had a four-wheeler in the back. We spent time in the mountains. We, I had, a, I had a recording studio upstairs in what was supposed to be our master bedroom, but I ended up taking, she gave it to me to record in. So we, we slept in another bedroom upstairs in this big giant room that was all glass on one side was where I made records which was where we made money. That, that room was a money machine. And, but she continually said the whole time we were together in that house, things like the contractors moved the corner pegs of the foundations of the houses and faced in the right way. Uh, and, and, and let me, let me clarify this. It wasn't facing the wrong way by any huge margin. It was faced the wrong way by about 8 or 10 inches. She wanted the house moved slightly to the right by 8 or 10 inches. And because of this, she used to tell people all the time, she hated the house. I hate this house. I'd like to just burn it down and start again. Because it's facing the wrong way. By 8 or 10 inches. Every window in that house was a panoramic 
wonderland, every window in the house. But she held on to that, and it and it ate at her. It and you could see it eating at her. And th things like that, like that's just incredibly ridiculous pieces of minutiae that, or however you say that word, and uh, <laughs> that that just didn't matter. It there, there was no. It mattered to her, right? So this made. This made life incredibly difficult for me. And it was, it wasn't just a me, it was anybody who was around us. Could, she was so unhappy and ready to pounce on anything that she deemed, you know, whatever, improper or an insulting or whatever, that it just, it, it, she, she exuded this negative energy that I had just learned to ignore, you know, because I loved her. She, she, she was, there was parts of her that were really good. And I just, and she had bad tendency of, of basically gaslighting me. She would tell, she would tell me things that I, that supposedly happened or that were said or done so many times she'd accuse me of it, and, and I knew she was wrong. But after a while, it was easier to just to just agree with her because she would she would push on me to the point where I just have to leave the house. I would leave. I would get in the car and I would just start driving. And I I did that several times. You know, I just get in the car and think, well, I could just keep going. Or, or run this fucker into a tree. Like what, like, it was that bad. It was, it was a desperate, desperate situation by times when she was on the war path about something that ultimately meant nothing in the big, it just meant nothing. It was absolute bullshit. But to her, it was everything. So it, it was a very complicated relationship and every and everybody that came it, that was touched by it ended up running away and I don't blame them because it was it was difficult to be caught in the center between me and her it was ugly and so there, I'll give you another a good example this of this commerce that I spoke about like people I met a, I met a guy I met a guy in Alberta once who was a master jeweler. And everybody knows I like rings and jewelry and I always have and I've always kept, you know, big collections of basically costume jewelry. I can't afford obviously never could afford to to buy real gold or whatever. I always kept good costume stuff around and once in a while I'd have enough money to buy a, a gold something that was gold or something was given to me or whatever. But I wore a lot of silver and wore a lot of, you know, I, I wasn't, a, I'm not an expensive jewelry guy, but I like to look like I have some. And these days I don't wear very much at all, but this guy knew my, my penchant for collecting jewelry and watches and, and pendants and things. And, and he came up to me one day at, at a gig and he, he, he gave me a drawing. He said, I want to make this record, this record. I want to make this ring for you. And he said, what is your birthstone? And I said, it's a garnet. And he said, well, well it's perfect. He said, I want to make this ring. And so the ring was an astounding piece of art. It was huge. It had a garnet in the middle of it, a princess cut garnet that was about a centimeter across. And around the garnet was a ship's wheel and on the sides of it were the Molly May was on one side. On the other side, there was, a, I think, I believe a lyric or something engraved on the other side. And this ring was huge, and it was gold, made it going to be made out of gold. And it was just mind-boggling. This thing was going to be incredible. So I was concerned, of course, because I, I, I realized this, this piece of jewelry was going to cost a lot of money. And... Uh, I said, well, you know, 
I said, I don't really know if I have enough cash, money, you know, enough money to buy something like that. And he said, you know, don't worry about it. He said, just pay me over time. Don't worry about it. I want you to have this. And so, I don't know, it was a couple months later that we were back in Alberta and uh, he brought the ring down and gave it to me and it was unbelievable. It was it was a work of art, the, something that I had just never, and he, and he was so proud, and I was so proud that he gave it to me, wanted, thought enough of my music and me to build it, and these people were very, very nice. He was a man, an older, older gentleman and his wife, and they were really nice people. I don't know, I don't know if I should say they were older. They were older than me. They were in their 40s, probably, or maybe late 40s or early 50s, or something like that, and so... This ring instantly became a problem with Hilda. Not just a problem. She was livid that I had taken this ring. And I was like, I don't understand. Why, why are you so upset about this? And she, they, those people want something for you. They're not, they're not doing this. They're not doing this out of the goodness of their heart. They're trying to, trying to control you. And they're, they want something from you. And I was like, yeah, they want to be my friend, right? They want to be my friends. Like, they're not, it's not, there's nothing nefarious here. You, you, and I'm telling you what, I had this ring on my hand for, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks. We, 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 we went back home off that tour. And then here was, here was the kicker. Two or three weeks after I had the ring, and every time she looked at this ring, you could just... I had it on my hand, and it was so bad after a while that I had to just take it off and hide it. I couldn't wear it around her. Because she would look at that ring, and you saw the look on her face. It was like some she wanted to murder somebody. And I and I was just this I was just like this, I I don't understand. I couldn't understand what was what was the problem. Like I knew what her reasoning was, but I couldn't understand why. She couldn't get by that and realize it wasn't true. So then they, these poor people that built this ring, this man and his wife, they, you know, and at that time I was, you know, I was overtly Christian and, you know, I still hadn't lost, shaken off all my, all my Pentecostal roots from the States. And I, and I spoke about God a lot and I prayed for people and I did different things like that when I was out on the road and, they knew that everybody knew that you know and so one day we get a package in the mail and it's from the jeweler's wife and it's for Hilda and basically it was a it was a huge hardcover kind of a coffee table tome about the life of Jesus and it was fully illustrated and it was gorgeous and it had a lot, it had all kinds of history in it. And it had, I, th I thought, wow, that's a really cool, I was excited about it. I thought that's a beautiful thing, you know, to send somebody. It was obvious, it was old. It, 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 uh, it was well used and it was, you know, but it, it was, it looked to me like sort of a rare book. I'd never seen anything like it. So Hilda opens this package and sees this book and she goes, that's it. You're sending that ring back. And I was like, what? And she and Hilda says, these people are trying to convert, convert me from Catholicism. And I'm not interested in their religion. And she went, she just went ballistic. She went ballistic. This went on for days because I was, I was fighting it. I was like, I said, this is not what you think it is. Well, it is. And so I was, you know, I, I, it's, it's three or four days of her yelling at me or not speaking to me at all. She took the book and threw it in the garbage. She got on the phone to her mother, her mother, and started ta telling her mother that these weirdos in Alberta were, were some kind of a cult and that they were trying, they, they gave me a ring and now they're trying to convert her out of her Catholicism. And I, I was like, oh my God. God almighty Jesus help us. And it got so bad. I I was actually down in New Glasgow. I went I was working with Dave, I think, on some project or another. 
And I was in New Glasgow, and and I had a I had a cell phone at that time. Amazingly, I, I had one of the, we were one of the first people to even have cell phones in our in our neighborhood in our region there. And it was an old it was a flip phone, you know, big old heavy thing with an antenna. And so there was some there was a phone call between me and her that was just. <laughs> Like, there's no way to even explain these conversations. They were her, you know, yelling and screaming at me about uh, insanity, th the things that weren't even real. And there was, it was either I went along with it or I, 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 I would be tortured incessantly until I gave up and gave in. So I said, fine, fine, I'll call the guy right now, get his address, I'll ship the goddamn ring to him from here. I'll send it, I'll send it. And, I, and so I did. And I got on a payphone. I don't know why I was on a payphone, but I used my, I had a calling, we had calling cards then too. <laughs> used my calling card to call, because oh, we probably didn't have a long distance plan on the cell phone. But anyhow, called this guy up and I said, listen, my wife is, doesn't want this, any of this to go down and we can't afford the ring and blah, blah, blah. And, guy was heartbroken he's like what he said he said it he said we didn't mean anything by that it, he, he said we we i just really wanted you to have the ring he said i'm i'm not it, he said i'm not in any hurry for you to give me money for that he said i did it because i love your music and i, and I wanted you to have it and i said yeah i understand that i said but i have to live here <laughs> i can't withstand the pressure of the of keeping this ring or or having frankly having anything more to do with you and it's not my choice but that's the way it is and so he gave me his address and i went to the i stepped across to the there was a post office right across the, from where i was and i went into the post office and i wrapped the ring up real good and put it in a box and sent it back to alberta and this was my life Right. This this was my life. This is this is how, I don't know. I can't even count the number of times where people tried to help me, and Hilda immediately just went, "No, they're, they they don't want to help you. They're doing they're doing this this and this, and they I don't trust them and 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 whatever." And it just it became to where if everybody, if anybody reached out to me, I just shut them down immediately, and. That's the way things were going. I always have to, you know, try to speak in Hilda's defense, too, because the place where she was from, you know, where my, where my family was from, the history of that town is, you know, pretty black. Like, it's, it's a dark spot. It has a history that uh, is not pleasant. It was settled by... You know, Acadians who were fleeing the, the British dur during the expulsion, who escaped, uh, you know, Grand Pre, 12 families, uh, and they made their way overland and, you know, across the ice up to Cape Breton Island until they got to the furthest tip that they could get. Um, up on the uh, western coast of Cape Breton, and that's where they stopped because they found uh, the harbor there, Shetty Camp, Shetty Camp Harbor. Uh, Shetty Camp, uh, I believe, means fish house. So that's where they started to fish and dry fish and interact with the Mi'kmaq, and who were who were close allies. And it, it was a it was a it's completely secluded, and they wanted it that way. They, that's that's what they they wanted to be by themselves. They they felt obviously they were threatened by the British. Things were going on over on the other side at Louisburg. You know the fortress of Louisburg, which changed hands about a hundred times between the British and the French, and uh, and so they they lived up there in complete isolation, and. According to my father, like people didn't even speak English up there until well into the sixties and seventies. They did, but they didn't use it. Everybody spoke in French, and it 
to give you an example, right? So for those of you who are not Canadian, perhaps, and, and don't know how things work up here, but we have a system, an unemployment system up here that where you work, when you work, you pay into the unemployment benefit system and you get a stamp. Uh, they call it a stamp, right? You get a stamp that proves you worked a week of the year. And if you get so many, if you get, you know, so many stamps per year, when your job runs out, if it runs out, you use those stamps to collect unemployment benefits for a year. And so a lot of people, a lot of people, in, especially in Nova Scotia and in, in places like Shetty Camp and the small places in Cape Breton where tourism, you know, is a major business, a lot of people just work in the summer. They get, they get enough work through the good weather to get their stamps and then they go on unemployment all winter long and don't work. And it's a bit of a scam on the system because they, a lot of people, they could work all year round. They just choose not to. Why would they, why would they work when they can sit on their ass for six months a year, right? So, I mean, that's, that's kind of harsh, but it is the truth. Like I, and I never collected unemployment, unemployment benefits in my life. I never went on it. Because I didn't do that kind of work, like I didn't do an hour, I didn't wasn't working for hourly wages ever. I did, but my main focus, of course, was, was playing music and making money that way. So anyhow, to give you an example, you know, like when I first moved up there, with got married, moved up there, people couldn't understand. Even they just didn't know where I was getting my money. They couldn't figure that one out. I had multiple people you know, would come up to me, hey, JP, blah, 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 how you doing, thing, blah, blah. And I'd be saying, yeah, we're doing great, we just did this tour, we did that festival, whatever. And they would ask me to my face, well, how are you getting, how are you making your stamps? They they would ask me this, right? Uh, when, you know, I, I, I don't, it's, I'm not uh, being bragging, but... I was making more money in two hours than they would make over the winter sometimes, you know, on, on, on unemployment benefits. It's only paid sometimes eight, 800 bucks to 900 bucks a month. I could make $5,000 at a festival in three days, right? They just didn't get that. And they, they never did get it. Some did. Some people get it, got it. And, of course, the rumor mill would would just be on fire up there about us, about where the hell we were getting all this money and they just didn't seem to get it that we were going out making money playing music and there, the people up there that did get it would would you know insert themselves in the rumor mill and go you guys are all you guys need to just shut up because you know jp is does what he does he goes out and he makes a year's wages in a month and comes back and does his and that's that right like get over yourselves he's not doesn't need to get stamps. He doesn't need to go on unemployment. His job never ends. It's, it's year round. So Hilda came up in, in that, in that world, right? She came up in the world where music was a secondary income source because, you know, you can't, you couldn't make any money just being an accompanist on the, for fiddlers. And that's what she did. You'd get paid a hundred bucks or $150 or sometimes you know, sometimes she claimed that people would split split the dance money with her down the middle where she'd get 400 bucks to play a dance, but I never saw that happen. I, I And I, she it may be true, I don't know. Maybe some people did that, I'm not sure. But she lived her life with music as a secondary income source, and she would get jobs like dinner theater and, and hourly wage jobs, and she was in the world where, you know, to get, to be making $150 a week, a week or, or a night, I mean, or whatever it was, you know, and to have $4,000, $5,000 in the bank was set for life. Like that was her, and she could have done that. And she's probably doing it now. Like she was frugal and good with money. But the reason she was so frugal, she was afraid to just to do anything. And but possibly, or not possibly, 
like it was just a it was just a a societal thing combined with the, a familial thing that led her to be the way most people are up there you know like it's just and so i don't think she handled our fame and wealth very well she never she just sort of didn't accept it she wouldn't partake of you know there was always lots of money in our bank account but she didn't feel it was hers and which was half of it was and but she didn't want any part of that she demanded to be paid separately and things like that and it was just so there was a whole dynamic going on with her and that place now when we built this house we she picked out the people that would be involved and i thought okay surely to god somebody who is as suspicious as this woman seems to be is not going to pick out people who are going to rip us off so but somehow she picked up the unholy uh quadfectra I just made up a word there. Uh, uh, these four guys that ended up building this house. So there was the main contractor, a plumber, an electrician, and a building supply guy. So to make a very long, long, painful, painful story short, they built this house and fought with her all the time because she, you, again, her never be happy gene kept coming on and she would just shit on these guys continually to the point where they stopped coming back to the house. They left the house unfinished. Like plumbing stuff not hooked up and walls not finished. And temporary staircases in the house. And so, but the problem was uh, she was right to be pissed off at them. And, and the reason was is that these guys thought we had a ton of money well we actually kind of did have a ton of money but they were intent on taking advantage of it so there was the contractor uh, taking uh, buying supplies in my name from the building supply guy that wasn't coming to our site the electrician and plumber were paying each other from out of my pocket to do bullshit jobs at full at full tradesman rate that could have been done by assistants and helpers so for instance when the plumber was in there working he was paying the electrician you know $25 an hour or $30 or something ridiculous 30 I don't know it was a lot of money to sand off the ends of copper pipe so we had so we had two we had three tradesmen all working in concert billing me for it's ridiculous amounts of money to do all this work that didn't need to be done by professional tradesmen supplies that were not even coming to the job site and on top of this this building supply guy was charging me 37% interest on our bill there. So when, when when everything finally blew up and these guys left us there with an incomplete house and Hilda losing her mind, I started to lose my mind. And I was like, okay, that's it. I've had enough of this. I'm going to find out what the fuck is going on here. So I called. I found a private independent building inspector from outside Inverness County. He came over from Sydney. Because no goddamn way, I knew that if I got somebody from inside Inverness County, that there there's just too many people know each other. And I wouldn't have got an accurate uh, assessment of the building because too many people know each other. They all used to cover each other's mistakes and just horrible. It was just horrible things that they used to do. 
And just because they knew each other, they had to keep working together so that nobody would, would tell on the other fella because God knows what would happen, right? So in comes this inspector. And he come in the house and I said, he said, why are you doing this? I said, well, I'm doing it because the house is incomplete. We've got a number of people trying to get us to pay them, including a building supply guy who can't even prove where all the materials went who's looking for like forty or fifty, sixty thousand dollars worth of worth of uh, bill and his interest rate apparently is about thirty seven percent. I didn't even know that. It's three points off of being usury. And uh I don't know how they expected this all to remain a secret, but I guess they did. They 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 were really were used to people just bending over and taking it up the ass. So the, I said I said I want an accurate, honest this is, this is, I want this because I want an accurate portrayal of where we stand in this construction process. And I want you to be completely honest with us. And, uh, and he was, he was a super honest guy. He, we didn't know him. He didn't know the people we were dealing with. I, I made sure of that. And obviously he didn't because after he did this inspection, he wrote up, he wrote up a paper and we got it in the mail about a week later. And so this this inspection he wrote out. <laughs> the house had 37, 37 infractions of the Canada Building Code. Uh, some of which he used the words catastrophic structure failure. That's that's how bad some of these uh, infractions were. They had done things that were just unbelievable. Like, we had in-floor heat in the house. He found hoses, water hoses, that were carrying, you know, antifreeze and hot water out of, out of the basement to heat the house. He found hoses that were spliced together with electrician's tape. Two pieces of fucking hose held together by electrical tape, right? This is an under pressure system. And all kinds of wiring and, and improper staircase construction and load bearing walls that were not actually load doing the job. Like, like, it was just unbelievable. It was unfucking believable. And so at this point in time, I just, I called up the building supply guy who had sort of become the ringleader. And I said, look, buddy, I'm not paying you a fucking dime. I said, this house is a mess. You can't even prove where, where half this material went. I'm not getting invoices. There's all kinds of things that I'm getting that I didn't approve that you're charging me for. And... I, I hear, I understand that your interest rate is three points off of usury. And I never agreed to any of that. And so that, that set the battlefield. So he sued us. And I had learned a long time, like I learned a lot about this business, about legal issues from this business, right? And I, I knew <clears throat> that forcing somebody into confronting you in court was the best way to do things. You never launch lawsuits against people because that's the side that pays all the money. You you let people sue you and then it costs nothing to defend a lawsuit. It's, you have to be in the right though. You can't do it if you're in the wrong. But we were definitely we were definitely in the right. And so sure enough he sued us. And we we got a lawyer from down in uh, Port Oxbury, who, uh, a law firm that always represented me, beautiful guys, and this this lawyer that, that came with us, <coughs> he was like Matlock, man, he was a powerful lawyer, and we went into the courtroom, and, and the lawyer said to me, and Hilda said, don't even, said, don't even come up front, sit in the back, I, I got this, <laughs> and so, anyhow, the judge looked at everything. We had compiled everything together we could find. 
The judge looked at everything, and he looked at this building supply guy and the contractor who had showed up with him and said, you guys are crazy. You can't sue this man for what you're suing him for, especially seeing as you are just a few points off of having a legal interest on this bill. And he said, I, he said I, I'm throwing this out. You guys get out of my courtroom. And I suggest, strongly suggest that you make some kind of actual realistic uh, arrangement with Mr. Cormier to get whatever is owed, uh, what is realistically owed. And he's going to have to be reimbursed for the problems with the building and blah, blah, blah. And so anyhow, by the end of it, I, I, uh, <laughs> at this time as well, this is uh, so many th weird things happened to us. God almighty. Right before all this happened, uh, we were rear-ended by a guy in Halifax that goddamn near killed us, uh, tore both of our necks all the shit, healed us, my shoulder, healed his neck back, and we sued this guy, and we won. We got a $100,000 settlement. So we, me and Hilda each had fifty grand in the pocket, and so when we got back off the off this court case, I called the building supply guy and said, "Okay, buddy, you're looking for seventy five or eighty thousand dollars. We know that's all bullshit." I said, "I'll give you twenty, and that's all I'm giving you." And his words, I couldn't believe it. His words, after everything he'd done to us, him and this this other crew of these three arseholes left us in a house that was literally in danger of falling down on us. Uh, he says to me, come on, man, give me a chance. <laughs> uh, yeah, I said, I said, where was my chance, fucker? I said, you never gave me a chance, and this is all you're getting. You could take it or leave it. And so he took it, and that was the end of the whole thing. I later went out and found the the electrician and confronted him and told him what I knew that they had done and he admitted all of it and he apologized he apologized but he but he also didn't he also didn't uh, it was an apology but it was also like a well you were dumb enough to let us do it so fuck you like that was kind of his thing but I ended up just I was going to beat him to death but I didn't bother. So, anyhow, that sort of ended the the beginning of like the first few years of the construction of that house. And then we had uh, Hilda's granduncle Harry and his son-in-law come in and and do a lot of the finish work and and repair, you know, these all these mistakes that were made. And uh, it all worked out good. Even they were, you know, at the end of their rope with her trying to work with her. Because she, she wanted everything. She wanted this, this, and this. But only one thing was possible. And so it was difficult to work with her. And, you know, it's, it, it's uh, I've been told by contractors that, you know, it's difficult working with married couples building houses because there's never really a consensus between a, a husband and a wife on anything like that. So it gets very difficult. These And these guys were very professional and get the job done and we were able to sort of salvage the house, even though most of it wasn't finished, including the entire kitchen. We never had a kitchen. We had a kitchen, but it was the countertops were plywood still. We never got the kitchen finished. I remember even my brother David came up and tried to help us finish everything, and, and it, that didn't work out because of Hilda. Hilda was just pissed off at, at Dave and, and pissed off at everything. And I, in the middle of the goddamn night, I, 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 I went into Dave's bedroom and said, we got to go. i got to take you back to Halifax, man. I can't can't stay with this you're gonna she is and dave was like yeah i know okay good and we i took him back home he was virtually homeless as a matter of fact he actually ended up on homeless just after that and moved back to thunder bay where he died a few years later and the house 
the house is important in this story because it just plays such an immense part in the in the in the underground of what was going on with the music. Uh, we were coming from a place where we, where she definitely wasn't happy, and I couldn't be happy because she wasn't happy. So there was just there was no home base for us for me. I tried to make the best of it, but it it it. And I did a lot of times. We had, and we had good times too. It wasn't like it was all shit. It, there was some really good times had in that house with other people, and great music made there. We that studio produced albums like The Messenger and Looking Back and Times Eight and the banjo record and 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 uh, Velvet Arm Golden Ham. Me and my uncle Joe, uh, right up to. Um, I can't remember what the last album I produced there. I think it was the mess. I think it was the Messenger Looking Back Volume Two series that I, it was the last thing I ever produced there. Primary Color was made there. It was like the the house itself. There was a lot of good things happened there, uh, but there was this always this underlying turbulence, you know, that I couldn't I couldn't stop it. I couldn't get it to stop. And uh, so it was difficult. The life and music story has become a cautionary tale for, you know, young couples building houses. <laughs> Again, like, I tell these stories, but Jesus, this, is, this happens to a lot of people. And we actually got lucky because the house didn't fall in. We were able to get most of the repairs done by family who were contractors. And, you know as unhappy uh, even after all the work was you know we fit we sort of stopped working on the house uh and let it be hilda was still never happy with the house and wanted to burn it down and start again because it was eight inches off the of square for her liking um like by the time we were done i had about i don't know two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in that house or something like that and we sold the house where we divorced and got two seventy for it, and then if, and and I and I all the time that I was in that house with her with Hilda, I kept saying, you know, you realize that we're better off than anybody we know. We, we're sitting here. This house is worth a fortune. It doesn't matter if you like it or not, uh, for whatever stupid tiny reason. It. You, you even look out these windows and go outside and you realize what we have here and it never could convince her of that and when we divorced and sold the house and got under $300,000 for it because she wouldn't didn't want to ask any more for it and neither did the realtor the realtor said oh about 300 grand is all you're going to get yeah someone bought the house immediately uh, the realtor even told me, you know, it, it won't sell. <laughs> it was sold in 10 days. And immediately uh, they finished the kitchen in the house and they put a kitchen in the house, which was really all it was sort of missing. And, well, there was other things missing, but there were small things. So they did, they put 30 grand or something into the house probably and then sold it again for seven hundred thousand dollars six hundred and eighty six thousand dollars that house was sold for not 90 days after we sold it for 269 so I, it was uh, depressing that that was uh, that was very depressing um but it teaches you a lesson right uh jumping ahead you know to the end of the marriage which i'll have to probably go into at some point but you know at that time when i when all that happened i thought after everything that we went through for, for that house the whole this just a horror story for better part of 10 years um it was just like what does any of this even matter why why do people even bother trying to accumulate wealth and, and uh, you know, uh, possessions 
and all these things, when all of it can just be taken away by simple commonplace circumstance, it doesn't make any sense. And uh, from that day forward, I refuse to accumulate anything, and I haven't to this day. I I still have the I I don't even have the guitars I used to have. I used, you know, there was a time in that house when we were doing really well. I had forty guitars, right? I'll never do that again. It's not worth it unless I run into a ton of money and, and I'm able to collect, you know, valuable instruments. It just doesn't mean it just doesn't mean anything. None of it means anything. The only thing that means anything is your own personal happiness. And if and if you have a roof and food and your bills are paid and you have good people around you, there really isn't anything else. The the thing I don't I uh, it's been said, I don't remember who said it, but a wise man said our unhappiness as people comes from our desire to accumulate things, right? It's 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 the covet the coveting and jealousy of looking at people who have more things than us that makes us unhappy is our is our desire to acquire. Eh, it doesn't make any sense and it doesn't mean a goddamn thing. Especially now, when we're looking at being in the middle of a pandemic, people are dying, people are sick, you know, it doesn't matter. What, what matters is us. We matter. Our individual life forces and the things that we can contribute to each other by being good humans, right? Not by giving goods or money or or trying to get goods and money. You just got to keep your bills paid. That's it. And then live your life. Live every day like it doesn't matter what happens tomorrow. Or what happened before. Right? Which is another lesson I've taught myself through this process. Of, of doing this show now for over a year. And not even really getting out of my mid-twenties yet. I mean, uh, I've... I, it, the past doesn't really matter either. It it does if you let it shape your future. But unfortunately, a lot of us don't realize that until you're my age. You know, 52. I look back in the past, some of it I don't even remember. Cause at the time, it was a huge deal and horrendous and blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, what does it matter now? Doesn't matter. Nothing matters now. You can't go back and change any of it. So, I hope that we learn this, you know, as a species over the coming years because of, of what's happened with the, I think the black flies are hungry, uh, because of what's happened, you know, with everything in the world right now, that we just learn to live in the moment, you know, be a dog. Dogs live in the moment and they're happy. And that's why they're happy, because they don't think about the past, they don't consider what's going to happen in the future, and they're not trying to acquire anything except the love of the humans in the room. That's it. We could be like that. Why not? <laughs>